morning, students. Um, I hope that we'll be okay with the video today. One of my neighbors is having some construction work done in their backyard, so there's a kind of a loud sound, but I'm gonna go ahead and give it a try. I think we'll be okay. Let's take a look at our morning message. May 18th, 2020. Dear students, we have been learning about Thomas Jefferson. He loved to read. He loved to write. Let's find out what else he liked. So let's reread that, it's a little long. We have been learning about Thomas Jefferson. Sure enough, he loved to read. Yeah, I'm making a connection to some of the learning we did last week. It talked about how he even inherited uh, about 40 books, I think, from his dad. So he already had books even when he was young. He loved to write. Oh, I'm making a connection to a very famous document that he was the main writer for. Can you think of what that was? The Declaration of Independence, right? Let's find out what else he liked. Mrs. Kilmer. So today, I've got a really fun book for you. It's called Thomas Jefferson's Feast. And on the cover, I see Thomas Jefferson and he's got some people at his dinner table and I see some bowls and platters with other kinds of food. I wonder what kind of food that is going to be. Hmm. I see some tomatoes. I don't know if that's mac and cheese. Let's see. Oh, and there is a little blurb on the back. Let's take a look. What this book is about. Thomas Jefferson's Feast. Do you love French fries and ice cream? <laughs> a lot of people do. So did Thomas Jefferson. Discover how he brought these and other yummy foods to America. Oh, wow. Okay, let's get started. Oh, even up on this little first page, there's a cute little picture of Jefferson eating some corn on the cob, and then there's a little bird there. Thomas Jefferson's Feast by Frank Murphy, illustrated by Richard Waltz. And on the title page, I see a bowl of tomatoes, and there's a little bird standing on the edge of the plate. Hey, it looks kind of like mac and cheese. That's funny. Random House, New York. There's a close-up. Oh, so there I see Thomas Jefferson sitting under a tree. And he looks like he's reading a newspaper, the Virginia Gazette. Remember, Gazette is an old-fashioned name for a newspaper. 1776, and there's Monticello. And look, that little blackbird is on his shoulder. I wonder if this is the kind of book where there's going to be a little, maybe a little bird on every page. Yeah, you could keep an eye out for that. Long ago, before your great-great-grandparents were born, there lived a man named Thomas Jefferson. You probably know his name because he was the third president of the United States. But that's not all there is to know about Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson loved to read. He collected books about the stars and books about history. In fact, he had one of the largest libraries in America. Thomas Jefferson also loved to write. He wrote letters to people like Benjamin Franklin and George Washington. In his lifetime, he wrote over 20,000 letters. That's like writing a letter a day every day for 55 years. Can you imagine writing 20,000 letters? Wow. Okay, so if I take a close look at these illustrations on this page, there he is with all his books. And look, there's somebody else. And there he is writing something. And it's kind of cute if I try to read that note. The note says, Dear Ben, kite in a storm? Shocking. That's a little joke about Benjamin Franklin. I wonder if you get the joke. Okay, here we go. Many of Thomas's letters said that America should be its own country. The British thought America belonged to them. So Thomas Jefferson went to work writing the Declaration of Independence. He wrote and rewrote it for 17 days straight. 
until he got it just right. Wow, I'm remembering a picture in the other book we read that actually was a picture of the declaration. And remember how it is his writing and crossing out, just like in Writer's Workshop, how we edit and re-edit? So if I look closely at the illustration, I could see the date is June 23rd, 1776. So this is before the signing of the Declaration of Independence. And there's his buddy on the windowsill, his little bird buddy. Of course, with all that reading and writing and thinking, sometimes Thomas Jefferson got tired. Oh, that yawn is contagious. Sometimes his back hurt, and sometimes he got hungry. When that happened, dun, 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 I see ellipses. He usually took a break and had a snack because Thomas Jefferson really, really loved food. Oh, and there he's thinking about corn on the cob, and there he's having some corn on the cob. Oh my goodness, there is a poor horse pulling a wagon just piled high with food. Let's see. Thomas liked food so much, he sometimes spent as much as $50 on groceries in just one day. That would be like spending $750 today. So, you know, money is worth, uh, dollars are worth less now than they were before. So when it says that in one day he would spend $50, that's like if you went to the store today and bought $750 worth of food. And look at the, look at that funny picture with the wagon is just, the wheels are bending. Of course, that wouldn't really happen. The wagon wouldn't work anymore if it did that. But it's just showing how much. And this is also a reminder, we talked about here, that Jefferson really was quite a rich man, right? So, Thomas also spent a lot of time thinking about food. He even thought about better ways to get food. Sometimes Thomas Jefferson got hungry late at night after everyone else had gone to bed. When that happened, he had to tiptoe down the hallway and all the way downstairs to the kitchen. Then he had to fix a tray of food and carry it all the way back upstairs and down the long, dark hallway to the dining room. If he was lucky, there was still a little left when he sat down to eat. Ah, so I guess it's just a long trip around his big house and sometimes he would end up spilling things. Thomas needed an easier way to get his food upstairs, so he built a little elevator in his house. It was too small to carry people, but it could take food and drinks from the kitchen to the dining room upstairs without spilling a drop. Thomas called his invention a dumbwaiter. Thomas's dumbwaiter is still in his house in Virginia today, and it still works. So that's called a dumb waiter. It's like a little elevator that can transport things up and down in the house from the ground floor to the first floor, maybe up to the second floor without spilling stuff. A dumb waiter. So a waiter is a person who serves food and dumb is the old fashioned word. It's not a very nice word for for not being able to talk, for not talking, for no sound. So it's like a, a waiter that can bring you food, but it doesn't talk, right? Because it's just a little elevator. Thomas had a giant garden behind his house. The garden was 1,000 feet long. It was filled with more than 200 different kinds of fruits and vegetables. If you visit Thomas's house, Monticello, today, you can still see many of the fruit trees he planted. Wow. That's neat to think that some of those trees would still be there. It's making me think about Johnny Appleseed and all his apple trees. Sometimes Thomas wanted a snack from his garden, but the apples on the bottoms of the trees were usually already picked. Hmm, thought Thomas, there must be a simple way to get apples from the tops of the trees. Thomas found a long wooden pole. He attached a metal basket to it. The basket had hooks at the top. He used the hooks to pull off the apples. Presto, ripe apples fell into the basket. So there he is looking at an apple tree with the apples gone from the bottom. So how can he reach the ones at the top? And he invented this kind of basket on a stick. 
in 1784, Thomas sailed for France. Well, I got to stop to think. So this is after the revolution, after independence. And I'm remembering how George Washington sent him, sent Jefferson to France to teach Europe to be a representative of the United States and to teach Europe about the United States, right? He wanted to help make America's friendship with France stronger. Thomas was sad to leave America and Monticello, but he knew it was an important job. He also knew there would be lots of new food to try. And there he is looking forward. Thomas was right. In between meetings, he tasted macaroni covered with cheese. Oh, it was mac and cheese. He munched on potatoes fried in the French manner. So French fries. One night, he went to a dinner party. Hello, said Thomas. Bonjour, said his host. Bonjour means hello in French. Thomas's host offered him a special dessert. It was ice cream wrapped in a warm pie crust. Ice cream hadn't even come to America yet. Thomas took a bite. Good, said Thomas. Bon, said his host. Bon means good in French. So, bonjour and bon. And there's Thomas looking at the yummy dessert and having a taste. Delicious. Oh, well, look, even the little bird is there. That little bird is everywhere. During his visit, Thomas saw a Frenchman eating a bright red fruit. It was called a pomme d'amour. That means love apple in French. Thomas had seen the fruit before, but in America, it was usually just used for decoration. Most people thought it was poison, so no one ate it. Can you imagine thinking tomatoes are poisonous? Hmm. The Frenchman promised it was not poison, so Thomas took a bite. Thomas loved the love apple, the pomme d'amour, a love apple that is actually tomato. Thomas stayed in France for five years. When it was time for him to go back to America, he couldn't wait to share all his new favorite foods. He wrote down the recipes for macaroni and cheese, fried potatoes, and ice cream. He even decided to plant some love apples at Monticello. He waved goodbye to his French friends and got on the ship. Au revoir, he said. Au revoir means goodbye in French. So there he is collecting all his recipes, and there he is saying goodbye. How was France? Everyone asked when Thomas got home. Delicious, answered Thomas. He decided to have a feast to show off the new foods. Of course, that was easier said than done. Thomas planted love apple seeds and waited for them to grow. He drew a picture of a macaroni making machine that he had seen in France. Then he sent a friend all the way to Italy to buy one. Thomas had heard that Italy had the best macaroni making machines. He dug up potatoes from his garden. Finally, he made ice cream. This was not easy. First, he mixed cream and eggs and sugar. He packed it with ice and salt. Then he stirred and stirred and stirred. So here he's, there's, he drew a picture for the macaroni making machine that he had seen and sent someone to Italy to buy. So again, that shows you how rich he is that he's sending someone to Italy to buy a pasta machine a pasta making machine. There he is working on his potatoes and here he is working on ice cream. At last, everything was ready. The love apples were ripe, the macaroni was cheesy, the potatoes were crisp, the ice cream was icy. Perfect, said Thomas. Thomas invited all his friends. What's for dinner, they asked. It's a surprise, let's eat. Wow, making me hungry for lunch. Hmm. Thomas's guests loved the feast. They gobbled up the macaroni and cheese. They ate every last fried potato. 
they asked for more of Thomas's ice cream. They even asked for the recipes. When they were about to go home, Thomas noticed something. No one had touched their love apples. Everyone believed they were poisoned. Try them, Thomas begged. No thanks, everyone said, we're full. Thomas felt terrible. How could he get people to try love apples? Oh, so the one thing they wouldn't eat were the love apples. The next day, Thomas rode into the town of Lynchburg to visit a friend. He noticed a few love apples growing in her yard. Suddenly, Thomas had an idea. He asked if he could pick a few love apples, and his friend said yes. And the bird is even there, look, on the little fence post. Thomas walked down the street with the love apples. He raised one to his mouth. People stopped and pointed. What are you doing, they shouted. That's poison, stop. Thomas took a bite. Oh no, everyone said, save him. He's going to get sick. But Thomas didn't get sick, he just kept eating. Pretty soon, people got curious about the love apples. They tried them themselves. Scrumptious, everyone said. And to this day, Americans enjoy eating love apples, especially on pizza. Today, we still eat many of the foods Thomas Jefferson brought from France. Only now, we call potatoes fried in the French manner French fries. And we call love apples tomatoes, right? Macaroni and cheese is still called macaroni and cheese. And ice cream is still called ice cream. So in the back, there's an author's note and it says Thomas Jefferson stayed in France from 1784 to 1789. He may not have served all the foods in this book at one party, but he really did introduce them to America, and he was well known for his fancy dinner parties, so it just may have happened this way. Thomas Jefferson also really did have a pet mockingbird that flew around his study. His name was Dick, so that was the little black bird that was flying around in all the pictures. That was his pet mockingbird. And here's a portrait of Thomas Jefferson and his drawing of a macaroni maker. <laughs> so, I hope you enjoyed learning those fun facts about Thomas Jefferson, right? He loved to read, he loved to write, and he loved food. And so he worked hard to learn about new foods and how they were prepared and then how to grow them and, and prepare the foods after they were grown so that he could bring that to the United States, bring that to the new United States. Well, I hope you enjoyed that, and I'll see you later this afternoon for our fun story.